And I guess I, I got hired a lot even before Red, you know, when I was doing sessions and all that kind of stuff, because people said I had a sound for whatever it was. Like there was a certain way I played guitar, a certain way that I did whatever. But like for me, I guess I, I was, I've always been pretty focused on like what I like. And then if I like it, I assume that there have to be other people who probably are going to like it. And I really tried to not shape it for like what I think someone else might like. I just really tried to make myself like it as much as I could. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of 2020. I'm Siobhan here, as always, with Ben and Corey, and I am really excited this week to welcome on to the show a dear friend. For all the Star Set fans out there, get really excited. We have the incredible Rob Graves, Grammy-nominated, written so many amazing songs, produced a lot of the Star Set stuff, has worked with Red, has a bunch of solo projects. Um, you know, I don't even want to give it all away because I'm just really excited to introduce you to the people that may not know you Thank and, you. Um, you know, learn more about you for the people that may already know you a little bit. So Thanks. welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, yeah we mentioned it a little earlier, but uh, this is really just a ploy to steal your knowledge. Um, so <laughs> sure. I'm going to need, I'm gonna need your, your Pro Tools templates, uh, and your, your vocal chain. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> yeah, the amps. I get a lot of uh, people asking me the the amp and guitar setup since i started posting these reels people are like what guitars did you use what amps did you use i'll tell them it doesn't matter no that's and i i, I'm, yeah. I gotta say for anyone tuning in definitely check out your social media because i've actually been really enjoying that the session walkthroughs and oh, it's, cool, yeah. it, it's i'm blown away you know even playing in star set just kind of seeing all the stuff that goes into it and you know you're doing it with other artists too but it's it's been really yeah. cool to see what you're posting there cool thanks yeah you guys you pull it off incredible live, so I don't know how you do that, but it sounds amazing. Whenever I you know, it. as you followed along, it's been a work in progress getting it from, yeah. you know, where it started to what it is now. I mean, with seven people, there's a lot more that you can do with bringing things live. <laughs> I have a very important question. Rob, yeah. have you ever thought about being an airplane pilot? Um, I've, I've taken a few flight lessons in my life. Yeah, I've flown a little bit. Why? Because I just feel like if I was going to go right into a mountain, if you came on the intercom system, that I would be relaxed. Yeah, even if I was given really bad news, be like, "Hey, yeah, you're going to hit the you're going to hit the the, the mountain. We're, we're going about twenty thousand, yeah, twenty thousand feet above, but soon to be right on the ground and uh, yeah. four hundred miles an hour." Hi, I'm Rob, and uh, enjoy your <laughs> flight service. The good news, it'll be quick. You won't even feel it. Enjoy. Yeah. Whereas Ben could be saying something completely positive and you'd think yeah. you're going to die anyway. So, Screaming. <laughs> yeah, Screaming. I've always been kind of quiet. I don't know. I'm just kind of a soft spoken. I like to listen. I'm, I'm definitely a listener in a conversation. I like to so prod, which is great for a podcast. I know that's like super exciting to have. Like, no, it's no, but it's great. If you get mad at somebody in a studio, do you like just like hit the talk back button, but say nothing and they already know that you're mad at them? Um, well, yeah, passive aggressiveness can, can work wonders. I'm a different person in the studio, I would say. I think that the bands I work with would probably say that. I'm not like crazy and loud or anything, but I'm, I'm a bit more, yeah, animated, I would say. <laughs> but it's, it is a different world. You walk in and it's like a new persona. It's a little, little Jekyll and Hyde maybe, but yeah. yeah. Well, I guess maybe that's what makes a great producer, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> Speaking of being a producer, uh, it's an interesting career path and a think we'd all just like to know kind of how you first got into music uh, and, and sure. your first experience in that area. I think, yeah, I didn't, I didn't set out to be a producer, you know, initially I, I grew up like you guys are all very talented as well. So it, it's just like a, you grew up doing music and you're, you're probably, you know, in like the gifted groups and you're, you're doing a lot of it and it seems a little bit obvious that you might do this for a job. So it's similar the special to group, guys. Rob. We were always in the <laughs> special <laughs> groups. We were. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I just kind of grew up knowing I would do music. I wanted to go to Berkeley for some reason. I had that in my head um, in Boston, Berkeley College of Music. But I, I was all about guitar, actually. And I'm embarrassed to say that to you guys because I can't play like you guys can play. But uh, I, I was very into guitar. And I specifically, I, I just like, I played every instrument. And then I discovered uh, it's, it was Randy Rhodes. And the, this Ozzy Osbourne album, the live tribute album came out and it changed my whole life. Th that whole, that, it changed everything. I'm like, I want to quit drums and I just want to start playing guitar. That was it. So yeah, Randy Rhodes did it for me. And I was, you know, it was in high school. And so my whole world became, I wanted to, uh, I get kind of nerdy about it. So I, all I wanted to do was I wanted to play Randy's solos like to a track of 
a, a song that didn't have a solo in it. So I would, I spent all my time learning how to recreate Ozzy's songs. Like I got a drum wow. machine, a little a drum machine. Oh my God. Don't you know, you know you need to get to the sand of all V to be able to do it? I, you have to triple track <laughs> it with the Marshall and it has to be white or it won't sound like Randy. With, with that pedal. Remember that, that weird little distortion pedal you had? That like was the like, MXR um, thing? Yeah, had? the MXR. Yeah. <laughs> That, that I've almost bought that guitar like many times, and I just have never done it. I just like never like. It's it's silly. It, but... <laughs> There's no reason for it. It's completely eight thousand dollars of stupidity. It's ridiculous, yeah. but it's beautiful. I'm glad that you showed me this. <laughs> that was my life. So my wall was covered with him playing that guitar. You know, like that. Um, and I had to learn every solo, and then I wanted to play them to. You know, I didn't want to play it with him. I wanted to play it like just so I could hear myself play it. So I got a drum machine and the keyboard and, you know, bass and all that. So I would recreate the tracks just so I could play the solos. And, you know, I, at the time, of course, I didn't realize I was sort of learning to be a producer. Like I was learning how tracks are put together. And uh, I didn't even think of this until much later in life. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I spent all of high school doing was how to do this. And, you know, that early Aussie stuff was, there was, it was keyboards, but it, you know, it was kind of, orchestral sort of parts on the keyboards and you know randy played kind of classical and that explains probably a lot of my string sort of influence and that got me into you know like ingve malmsteen and tony mcalpine vinnie moore and all those guys sure i couldn't quite play like that but i really enjoyed listening to it and i i figured out how they put their tracks together and anyway it was all about guitar i wasn't really thinking much about producing or I didn't really know what that was. It, it wasn't even like a, a thing, really, you know, being a producer. But what, let me stop you there just for a second. So, I'm, I mean, I'm curious. So you're listening to these tracks and trying to recreate them. I mean, were you just listening to the album and trying to hear every instrument just, mm -hmm. I mean, because obviously this is, pro, you know, this is before now where there's YouTube, whatever you can yeah. get the isolated <laughs> tracks. I mean, you <laughs> like have to like sense. decode yeah. it. So you must have like either had an incredible ear or... I, I suppose trained an incredible ear by doing that. Well, I think it's how I developed it. You know, I don't know how accurate I always was, but I, it was very focused listening to every part. And I, cause I was like really meticulous. It had to be like, it couldn't just be like, oh, here are the chords and here's the basic drum beat. It was like the drum fill had to be the same. And yep. dude, so this, we're at like, we're on the same wavelength. That's the, that's the record. Yeah. It was. Yeah. No, but Wolf Marshall <laughs> taught me every single Wolf note. Marshall, is that the book? The Wolf That's Marshall the book. Tab, the tab yeah, th book. This is how you. This is before how you did it before the YouTubes. You yeah, had we Wolf had, Marshall. We had books give and you tabs. the and you're like, how, what does that mean? Like how, this is yeah. way over my head. <laughs> I still don't know any of it. I used yeah, I used tab a lot back in the day. Wolf Marshall was like anybody who grew up in like the '80s knows and was a guitar player knows that name Wolf Marshall. He was just, he he would transcribe all the albums like note for note to the detail. So yeah, that's how we learned it. But uh, yeah, I, I spent time really listening to every part and it had to be perfect. The drum fills were the same, all the, the bass lines were the same, um, keyboard part, everything had to be identical. So I just, I guess that's how I sort of train myself to do it. And I really was not even thinking about, that was a side effect. That was a total side effect. It was not an intentional thing. At that point, were you thinking like you wanted to play music in a band or like what was your, yeah, you your know, end goal with that? I, I really, it's funny. I, I just didn't have like a, I thought, yeah, maybe I wanted to, it was just this nebulous idea of, mm -hmm. I just want to be a guitar player or something, I, a musician. Like I didn't really even know, like it wasn't, there was not really a plan. I just, I figured it would like just figure itself out as I went along and I, I would go to Berkeley and that would like kind of answer everything because I'd be around good musicians and all that kind of stuff. So I did go to Berkeley for a year. And it, you know, that was a whole other thing. It's, I was pretty good at theory. I realized I had like, uh, I, I didn't, like I knew a lot of theory without realizing I knew it. I, I didn't have a name for it at all. So at Berkeley, they, you know, taught, I just kind of learned, oh, that's what that's called. Okay. I, but it was sort of like the stuff I knew, you know, like the intervals and all the different modes and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but man, it, it Berkeley broke me a little bit. Um, I came out of it really just music was demystified. I mean, so I'm young, I'm kind of immature. And, you know, of course now there's infinite mystery in the music, but then it was like, oh, okay. So I hear a song and I know what the chords are, I know what the notes are, I know what the key, all that kind of stuff. And it was just not interesting anymore. It was like, it was like math. 
or something. Mm. And uh, yeah. it like broke me a bit. I had to, the, I got out of it by, um, I finally just got like kind of pissed off really. And I just, I took my acoustic and I just started putting it in like random tunings that I didn't even, like not even real tunings, just like not even real alternate tunings, just totally made up. So I didn't know what was going to happen when I just started playing the guitar. And then like that kind of broke me out of like it, I couldn't it, predict what was going to happen. So that I needed to get back to that. And over time, you know, I just learned to turn that as we all have, you know, turn that part of your brain off. You don't need to like always be thinking about the theory. Um, it's always kind of lurking, but you turn it on when you need it. And then you hopefully can just forget it as much as possible. And Siobhan I, stifled by it. She, yeah. she literally, I, mean, I knew this she's was like, coming. <laughs> she's like, if I don't, if I don't flat the fourth right here, it's just not going to be a proper, you know, half cadence. And it's like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, but it doesn't sound very Kirk Hammett to me. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound Kirk. It's probably, it sounds more Tool, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but it is stifling. And I mean, good for you for having the, the foresight, I guess, to know that that it was like limiting you because I, you know, I grew up in classical music. And so that it's all about theory. It's like from as early on as you start, it's like you're, you're taking theory tests and you go to school and all your prerequisites for graduating is like analysis and theory and sight singing yeah. and, and all this stuff. So it's like the majority of your curriculum is, is geared towards like deconstructing music rather than constructing it, you know, and that is like the total anti- creative tool in a lot of ways if you want you know and then you it's so hard to undo it the longer that you're that you're a part of that process you know a great point because I, I think for me at least and probably for a lot of young people who are learning theory and get it and everything it's you start feeling like that's how you make music too and, the, and it isn't you know like the way you yeah. deconstruct it it like you said it, it's just not the way that you make it and and but she'll try to make it that way and that's where all the fun goes out of it is that's what happened to me. It's like I'm, I'm trying to kind of make it in the same way that I could deconstruct it, and I, I didn't get it yet that you have to, you know, not do it that way. So, yeah, I eventually figured it out. It was like a years long thing. So you said you were at Berkeley for a year. Mm -hmm. So did you do the right thing and meet people and then drop out and become a rock star? Is that <laughs> yeah? So yeah. that that's what you do. That that's the Berkeley yeah. path. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, I do know great musicians who have graduated from Berkeley. I'm going to say that first, but. Uh, it, yeah, it's like if someone graduated from Berkeley, it's like, oh, what ha <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it wasn't. Yeah, that's kind of the idea of, of it. It's a joke, but it, you know, because what was the the reason for leaving after? Was it the burnout or? Um, yeah, I mean, it just wasn't. Yeah, it was. I could tell it was not for me. Like, it just wasn't. First of all, it's a jazz school, and I, I'm sorry, I hate jazz. Like, sorry to any <laughs> jazz fans. It's just not, like, it never grew on me. It never became, like, a thing. I do not, I just don't like it. And uh, I probably hate it more because of Berkeley. I might, maybe I would <laughs> I, I would like it more if I hadn't gone to Berkeley, but it's a jazz school. So th that was it. And I just, I'm like, I, you know, I wanted to play, I got long hair, and I wanted to play metal, you know, I was fucking Randy Rhodes, you know. Get my flying V out, and these dudes are like, Ur. you know, just their little, you know, they get their footstool and they're doing like all these weird, you know. But you're the first per person that said that to me, and I didn't realize because my perception of Berkeley, having been in like the classical world, was like, oh, this is where all the like rock and roll and like contemporary people go. Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me that when we first talked, was like, oh, it's a jazz school, and I like I didn't realize huh. that that's really what it was. So it's interesting to share that perspective. It's that, a long time ago. I, maybe they're, they've changed. I don't know, but it was. Per, back I mean, then perhaps, it was. but. I think it's yeah. still probably heavily jazz focused, but I, I don't know. But yeah. it's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there were some pretty good rock players there. I just feel like they they taught they taught through jazz and not. Mm. I don't know. I just it was oversaturation. It's for me at least. And again, I'm like you know 18 or 19. I'm just very mature. So I was like, I hate jazz. I want to leave. You know that kind of thing. And, <laughs> but I, I did meet some people. Don't you still that. hate jazz now? Like I do. you hated jazz then, but don't you still hate jazz? I do. So I it's do. not like a 19 year old thing. It's just like a I don't like surprise music. I think it is. It makes me angry somehow. Like it's like I don't. Oh, me too. Because it's like you it's know just what? Annoying. I, it's just annoying. I'm. It's annoying. It's like what? Yeah. Well, do you feel like you walk into a jazz bar and like you're like I know music, and then you're like. There's no way I could follow these. Fu fuck you guys. Yeah. What the hell are you even playing <laughs> yeah. to? And they're like, yeah. it's just jazz, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but let me ask then, what are your uh, thoughts I'm on someone you. like Alex Skolnick who plays in Testament, but also has a jazz trio? Great musicians, like he obviously is, you know, they, they need some other thing. And yeah. I, it doesn't surprise me that 
there, there would be an overlap there. I, I guess, I mean, I don't like immediately think, oh, you play jazz, like there's something wrong with you. You're not a good musician. Like the great jazz players can do anything, you know, really. Sure. I don't, know why, I don't know why they choose to do jazz in that light if they can do anything else. <laughs> it doesn't pay particularly well either. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to like make some jazz people angry. I'm talking way too much about jazz. Oh, it's it's fine. No, it's good to be opinionated. I feel like Corey had a similar rant. Like after you went to Europe one time, you came back on the podcast. I was in and Austria and I, and I, there, you know, I was there the concert venue in the city I was staying at. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I should catch a concert while I'm here. And the John Schofield trio, who's John, I know, I knew of him. I know he's a ridiculous guitarist. I'm like, oh, I bought tickets, brought some the people I was with I sat there and like I'm like all right I'm like it'll pick up at some point I'm like oh, nope <laughs> nope and then the drummer like happen. hit the snare drum more than just like a light hit and I was so pumped it was that big like <laughs> God, God, doom, God. I'm like yes the most like rock and roll drum fill and then back into just three dudes on stage playing three different songs for a while yeah they're all different every now and then you'd hear a melody and I, I always catch that and like, Oh, he repeated that melody twice. That was awesome. Like, yeah. And then the jazz guys hated it. They're like, that was too, that part is too pop. He repeated it. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just go on record though, as saying that I like don't stop me now. I think it's one of Queens best songs. Mm. It's off the jazz record guys. Sorry. I went deep for that one. I don't. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm you're not a queen, queen fan. Really? You know, I'm not. If, if we uh, if we go the direction of talking about music, yeah, I'm, I, there's probably a lot of bands I don't like that, or not that I don't like Queen. It's just that I'm not like a I'm not super into them. That you people would probably assume. I, I've had it my whole life. People are like, oh, you must like Queen. You must like this band. You know, whatever. And it's like they're like that with Tool. It's like you, you must love Tool. And I kind of feel like Tool's almost like the the jazz thing. It's like yeah, it's like the jazz of metal. It's math. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. I remember seeing Tool in like 1998 or whatever on Ozfest, and I'm like, "What is this dude like? Just prancing around? Like this drummer's definitely doing some kind of jazz solo?" Because I mean, Danny Carey is a crazy ass drummer. Yeah, but I just remember thinking to myself, "Is is this above my head?" And then when I started like hearing Tool fans get into like chakras and like the type of wine and. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, no, this is just Dungeons and Dragons for even loosier losers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. Well, yeah, and I, look, they're incredible musicians and I love a perfect circle. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. a, I don't know. And I, they just do a different thing with Tool. And I, I I guess it's it's not that I don't like it. I just, you know, there's like those musicians that are, like whenever I'm with the Break and Bend guys, they're like, put on Tool. And they're like, they know every fucking thing, <laughs> like every little thing. And they're like doing it. I'm like, Cool guys. But don't you like, think Tool's trolling you? Well, maybe. Because I saw them. Because Maynard, okay, this is what he did. So Danny Carey has his drum set, and Maynard said, I don't want to distract from the music. And they had all the psychedelic stuff. So he stands to the side of the drum set and doesn't okay. move. He has his cowboy hat on. And then like 13 minutes and 48 seconds into Anima, he like kicks his leg up. And the whole crowd stands up and freaks out. It's like everyone the whole time, they're eye-fucking Maynard. So he's like, don't yeah. watch me. He's like, but watch me. But watch and it was well. so it was the most pretentious <laughs> bullshit like passive aggra- I, I couldn't be more bored oh, i literally would rather watch paint dry than go see tool live i'm sorry <laughs> they're great musicians I, there's just nothing nothing yeah. about them at all that i like Let's see how many enemies we can make in this episode yeah i know right all the jazz yeah. fans all the tool fans i know it's funny because i'm like a, i'm like a pretty positive person I, and i I'll think all i've done is talk about <laughs> we talk about things i don't like you know it's like no, yeah, it, we, yeah we br- it, Ben brings that out. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I mean, so for, for the viewers, I, I basically, I had a watch on, and I'm using this as an excuse. It's also because I'm just a terrible person. I made this poor guy, this Grammy Award winning producer, or, uh, excuse me, nominated, Grammy Award nominated not producer, not. wait for 25 minutes as he watched me also to try to connect my headphones, go through all the technical stuff. It's like, did you patch it in right? I'm asking him how to use my own program. So like, I already I already burnt him down. In fact, if you ask anyone that works with me, I get all the emotions out of people by pretending to be <laughs> stupid, but really just whittling down your patience. Pretending. Ben is the type that will turn on the talk back, but not say anything just to piss you off, just so that you know oh, you did okay. something wrong. Yeah. So that's the next level. path. But anyway, we, let's get back to being watch. positive. So before we get too topical, <laughs> we're going to come back to the point. OK, so you decided to leave Berkeley. Um, Berkeley. What happened from there? Because that, I mean, that's really bold. I feel like a lot of kids in that age range would be like, oh, no, I must. And I don't know what your, you know, parental influences were, if it was like you must stay in school or I think that's pretty bold to just like 
you know, know what you want and leave. So what happened? I don't, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't probably from a place of boldness back then. I just didn't know what I was doing. I, I wasn't sure, you know, it just wasn't like the right thing. And I, I, I left and took some time and just was like for a few years before I did anything else. But I, I didn't, there was somebody, I, I met a couple of people there. One guy in particular, uh, his name is Fred Paragano, which there's no way I could tell my whole story without Fred's a, a big part of that, which he hasn't really come back. We stayed close throughout the next few years. And like once he lived in New Jersey and once in a while, he was an engineer. And once in a while I would go out to his place in New Jersey and get a studio and we would like record demos and do stuff. So and just mess around, like write songs and do stuff. Um, it wasn't until later where I, I kind of just thought I was going to leave music. I went back to school to like, uh, I was going to be a doctor. I thought I was like a pre-med. I was a nerd just studying. Wow. But then once people sort of like figured out that I went to Berkeley, they started. What type like, of doctor? Uh, I, I wanted to be a surgeon at the time. <laughs> that's what I was, I mean, you don't really study that stuff until medical school, but that's in my head, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Well, you liked deconstructing songs. So you figured you might right. as well, so you might as well deconstruct beings. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why not? But, you know, I didn't know. I was just like, I like biology. So uh, this just seems interesting to me. Um, but I kept like, people started like, they figured out like, oh, this guy is a musician. Actually, he went to Berkeley. It's the, like bands were like, hey, could you like help us with our demo? We have like studio time and we want to record it. And I, so I, I did that. I made, you know, friends who are pretty good musicians at the college. And I just started producing like, demos for people and it, you know i i almost like couldn't stop doing it i really it really is like an example of a career choosing you it's like the biggest cliche but it's, that is exactly what happened I, I could not quit music if i had wanted to to the extent that like i was still in college and michael sweet from striper like somehow like heard one of the demos of like the little bands i produce and like found me on the college campus and asked me to produce his record, a solo record. Wow. And, you know, I was like, okay, that's, I didn't expect that, but uh, sure. Michael Sweet, why not? It's like Striper. Everyone's heard of Striper. <laughs> it's like, you know, so I did, I produced, I was in college, you know, I was like going to freaking anatomy class and then going over to the studio and producing Michael Sweet. It was really weird. But I, I still thought I was going to like be a doctor. Like I was just, had been ignoring it. And then, uh, I eventually went to Nashville. I'll try to like just get, you know, not spend too long in this whole story. But like, oh, that's I, okay. We we like the minutia, well, but <laughs> yeah, I I never know how boring it is. But I, I went to Nashville finally for actually uh, one of these same records that it was a a, a guy um, named Justin Christian that I worked with in college. He was just you know a student there that we became good friends. He was a good singer. I produced his record, and he had a bit of a budget, so we went. To Nashville to mix it, and by this time, the guy I mentioned from Berkeley, Fred Paragano, he was uh, doing pretty good in Nashville. He was like one of the first guys who got into the digital to like Pro Tools. He was like the first like Pro Tools guy in Nashville. So everyone was working on like ADATs. So this was like you know ninety nine, you know two thousand, and everyone was still working on ADATs, and they didn't <laughs> computers like. All the ADAT guys were telling us like, oh, computers aren't ever going to catch on. You know, people, <laughs> they don't sound as good as the ADAT sound and all this stuff. And but Fred really like he's even back at Berkeley, he, he always saw it like he we were like in the early 90s. He was like on his, you know, Apple 2GS working with like Mark, uh, Mark the Unicorn, like digital performer, like the first thing that was really out there, like telling us that computers were going to be the future. We're like, dude, what? Like it wasn't like he was the <laughs> only one. So he was way ahead of it. So when it really caught on and you could really start doing some cool stuff with computers, every like all the producers in Nashville started like figuring out that like this guy can do magic. Like literally like stuff that you couldn't even think of doing, you could now do. Uh, a good example was there was like a big, I think it was like a Michael W. Smith record or something where they cut the orchestra in the wrong key in like London. And somehow they cut the whole song that they were doing in the wrong key oh, no. and, they, and they needed it raised a half step. You know, this is back in the day. So this is like probably like a hundred thousand dollar, you know, session or something, at least for that, just that few hours they were there. So, uh, f you know, instead of going back and doing it again, like Fred could just go in there and it was a bit more complicated back then than it would be now, but boom, there it is. It's done. Here's your, you know, 
whole orchestra in a new key. So he was getting hired by everybody. It doesn't sound that impressive now, but man, back then it was like every, he was. So he was in all the stu- he was in all the studios, and he he was going to mix this little record for me. But, so we went down there, and I just got to like go in all the real nice studios at the time because this was back when there were still a lot of studios all through Nashville, and it was very just like whoa, like this is pretty cool. I I really kind of hit me in a I don't know. I saw it maybe for the first time as a possibility, and I, that was an issue. Is I, I didn't really. I didn't really know the options open to me. Like I knew that I had like a skill set, obviously, but I, I just wasn't thinking in terms of like what I could do as a musician. It wasn't like I could be a producer, I could be a songwriter, I could do I just didn't know. In terms of of being a producer and what you were doing, you know, for like the demos in college and stuff, what were you doing that made you stand out? Like was it did stuff you learned at Berkeley? Was it a technical side of things or was it just an arrange was it an arrangement or like a musical theory kind of thing? It was probably this arrangement and general production, just making their songs sound like they wanted them to sound like they, they, they had, they didn't have the ability to go into a studio and make the song sound like they knew they wanted it to sound whatever that was. And they didn't, I didn't know either. I mean, I, this is the thing is I, I just had like kind of figured it out, but it was, if you want it to sound this way, you have to kind of do this. And then that's, that probably won't work if that other thing's going on. So we need to get rid of that thing. And I don't know. I mean, it just sort of, I didn't even realize I was really doing, production but i think this is where like the early days of sitting there with my you know randy Rhodes stuff and trying to like it sort of came i'm like yeah i just knew how songs were constructed so i'm like well you first of all you can't have that thing in there it's never going to work because it's going to cover up the guitar so get rid of Mm -hmm. that and then we have to do so just sort of that like basically they were coming out of the studio with a song sounding like they wanted it to sound so other people would hear it and like oh we want you to do this and so i just did here and there just for fun, really. But I just still didn't even get that I was like producing. It wasn't even like a, it just didn't register. It really, it was the people around me, the other musicians who just kind of said like, I don't know what you're doing with this doctor thing, but you need to like <laughs> probably fuck off from that and go <laughs> do music. It's really, fa- it's fascinating because I, I think what what an amazing exercise learning how to basically copy something that you know so well inside and out that you're yep. it's just inherent in your nature which is crazy because during covid like Corey and i and siobhan attacked like some van halen and some skid like a bunch of songs we held sacred oh, yeah. but i'm like oh yeah can we can i do the keyboards for i'll wait and like put it through the marshall amp and make it sound like eddie van halen and like yeah. sitting at home attacking mm-hmm. songs that i thought like oh no that's verboten that was one of the greatest <laughs> leaps for me as somebody, as an engineer, as a producer, was just going, oh yeah, I can nail the brown sound. And it's like, you did that with Randy Rhodes. Now I have a very important question. That's the second question to that. Sure. Now going back and as an adult, I don't like Randy Rhodes' tone. I love Randy Rhodes. I love all of that. Yeah. So let me ask you this. As you've gotten older, has the tone aged as well as just the songs have for you? Honestly, I didn't love his tone back then. Uh, I'm not a, I mean, this is... Another thing, like I'm not like a huge, I don't know, I'm not like a tone purist guy. Like I, it's not like, I mean, I guess I, I think I, when I'm producing a record, I guess I am. But when I'm listening, it's just not like a thing that I have to like totally connect to. I'm not like going, oh, check out the guitar tone. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm like listening to that riff, listening mm-hmm. like that kind of thing. You know, I'm listening to probably production elements beyond that. I don't know. Like, I mean, certainly the tone affects it, but I, I don't, to me, Randy just, it, I don't really judge it on those terms. It just sort of, it was what it was, you know, it was like the eighties and that it was that thing. Well, you, know? you named the most important thing. So I run the neurotic guitars.com. So I'm, I go and yell at people. And one of the things that, that annoys me the most is when people are like, I have the same rack mount thing that Nuno Betancourt has into the same 88. I'm like, yeah, but you're not fucking Nudo Bat- yeah. Betancourt. Like even yep. Nuno will tell you, like it's like the, my favorite stories ever are people that play through Eddie Van Halen's rig or play through like Brian May's rig. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. I played through all of Brian May's AC 30s and they sounded exactly like me. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I actually today, even I got a, a, somebody messaged me on Instagram asking what we used on the Innocence and Instinct record with Red and like, and how to get that tone, you know, how to get that big wall of guitar sound. And I'm like, well, it was diesel VH4s and PRSs, but 
you know, it's not going to matter really. It's like, it, it's just like, that was, we used that because that was what was right for those parts. You know, it's the same thing with tuning. People are like, how low is this record going to be? And it's like as low as it needs to be. Like you don't intentionally have to tune guitar low just because, which most people do, but it's all based on, you know, like where does this riff sit? Like, where's it going to sound the best and all that kind of other shit, you know, it's just, it very, has very little to do. I'm, I'm probably on the extreme of producers on this other end of like, I'm not, I just don't give a shit. Like we're, we're going to, it's going to sound right. And the tone, like whatever amps we're using, like we'll, we'll get it sounding good, but I'm not going to sit there all day and like dial in shit. And like, it's just not the way that I, I do it. I'll do that with vocals more than I will guitars, but yeah. I mean, I, I have guys that I know I work with guys like Jason Rao is a good example from breaking Ben. He was in red and like, he's a, he's that guy. He's like a super guitar tone guy. So I'll often, you know, like ask him if I have a question. <laughs> like, hey, you know, this isn't working. Like, what's what Corey will ruin your will ruin your life because I have thirty stack amps in there. I have VHTs, I have Splons, I have Mesa boogies, I have fifty one fifties. And then one day, Corey came over with a Kemper, and I'm like, yeah, oh, this soulless piece of shit can't do anything. He's like, oh yeah, really? Yeah. So what we did is I plugged my 5150 into my Mesa boogie with like a 421 and a 57. And that mm -hmm. asshole Michael Britt from that lovely band Lone Star still beat me every single time. Like I have the real amps, the real microphones. So the fake thing yeah. sounded better. So now it's like, why wouldn't I plug it in and just be like a keyboard? Just turn the volume up. <laughs> yeah, it's they're incredible now. They, they get because they get rid of all the bullshit that like if you're going to mic up an amp, for example, there's so many mistakes you can make. Like you can have the best tone in the world, but then like the mics you're using and the signal chain you're running, if you don't have, if there's a phase and all that. So the emulators just fix all that stuff. So you don't even have to, you're less likely yeah. to make a mistake. You're going to get a better tone, you know, but again, I'm not a purist. Like I know the purists will. If it, if it, if it works, it works. If, you know, if it sounds good, it is good. It's kind of the, yeah, the hard and fast rule, right? That's my, yeah. The profiler also, you know, I, I, you know, my clients that I work with, you know, they, they're not, they spend a lot of money. So it's like, you try to be respectful of their time. And it's right. like, I could, I have the, the amps and the cabs and we could go mic it up and start experimenting. But you know, the clock's ticking and it's like, you almost start feeling bad. Like, like I have, you know, honestly a Kemper or an Axe Effects or a plugin that you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Even if we spend the next three hours dialing yeah. this in. Mm hmm so let's just do that. And then if you don't like it, well, then we'll, then we'll move on to those other options and stuff. But you know, it, it always sounds yeah. good. <laughs> Corey was there when I saw the end of the world for this, because we had Barry Goudreau from Boston, you know, the band Boston, more than a feeling that guy came down mm -hmm. with his 62 SG and he, he's coming down to record a solo for something we're doing. And he sees all my amps. He goes, which one am I plug into? I'm like this Kemper. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me like I, like I was gonna be like, can I, can I have sex with your wife? He's like, this thing? And so I'm like, no, no, trust me, Barry. And Barry doesn't trust anybody. And I'm like, Corey, pull up something. And we pulled up like the first patch. He's like, oh, that sounds okay. Get to the second. That's pretty good. He goes, third one. That sounds like me. Can you give me a little? That really sounds like me. And he was so psyched. But he went from like, Oh, this is some soulless. Like I can't go to church on Sunday after this crap. To like, yeah. this is amazing sounding. It's just it sounds like me now. Like it That's always sounded like you, Barry. If you come from that world too, it's totally understandable. You'd be like, "There's no way this is going to sound that good." But, but also in yeah. Boston, they kind of invented that, right? The Rockman thing. Yeah, I mean, it, they definitely weren't. They were pioneer, or at least uh, was it Tom Schultz. Yeah, pioneers of like it was pretty much all him so i'm sure barry had no idea what amps were even being used at that point <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it's probably tom schultz playing his parts and just saying it's barry i'm pretty sure it might be <laughs> I, I think he recorded the entire like he pulled like a nuno and like was like i'm gonna just do this all and you know we'll bring in brad yeah. delp to come in and sing amazing vocals on top of it but. thank you for bringing up nuno because nuno Corey and i had the audacity because we did the song well, a song with nuno and, um, you know, he was the goat for me. I'm from Boston. Extreme. I Play love, with me. I thought yeah, I love Beethoven, it, yeah. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's the reason yeah. like I even <laughs> care about life. So he oh, sends yeah. us, we have Siobhan playing this beautiful, sweet string thing. I'm playing a whimsical piano part. And he sends uh, delay written before the, the effects <laughs> loop, like super loud. 
through whatever amp, like it sounds like he's pointing the SM57 at like a 90 degree axis the wrong way. And we're like, listen, I'm listening to it on my birthday. Okay, I'm, at, I'm with Siobhan in Miami. And I'm like, oh my God, Nuno played on the song. And she's like, she's never heard of Nuno. She's like, is this the guy you think? It, she's like freaking out. She's like, is this really what you think this guy's what? And I, I'm like, I'm so upset about it. I, I sent him a text message. Hey, Nuno, is it possible you could send us a DI? It sound, the, the sound sounds a little bit like, I, I don't know what adjective I use, but yeah. he wrote the wrong one. a four-page a four <laughs> message like, Igve doesn't mind my messy sound. Steve I, when he's walking past me, when Bob St. John, no he was like, you think he figured out my sound? <laughs> I figured out my sound. And then the next, so I said, why don't you, why, why don't you get a Kemper, right? He does a video with Taylor Hawkins and Hart and does Barracuda. What does he have on his desk? A fucking Kemper. He sends us the tracks for the next song. They're perfect. I'm just going to leave it at that. Well, he said he used the same microphone, the same amp, because he like went in this whole thing, because we're like, could you try a different microphone? Can you try to... Oh, man, don't... Save yourself the time. Don't ever say that to anyone like Nuno Betancourt. He will eat you. (laughs) I, remember I feel that. like Rob would have more tact in the way he delivered I'm, any information like that than Ben. <laughs> your tone sucks, bro. Like, get your shit over. Yeah, that would be a tough one, though, to navigate. You're like talking to like a legend. And it's like, what do you yeah. say? It's like, Oof. Yeah. But welcome to meeting me. I have no fear <laughs> with anyone. Oh, oh you were scared shitless when you got that text from him. Well, yeah, but I didn't have any fear sending it in the first place. Yeah, that was a very dramatic year in my life, just around the Nuno debacle. But oh, let's no, let's no. come back. Yeah. Let, let's come back to Rob because I, I we got to the point where you got to Nashville and you were talking about that. I'm interested in hearing like where your career went from that because you know you're you're everyone's saying okay, ditch this doctor thing and yeah. like what sort of like. I mean, you were recording people. You said that you were, you know, while you were in school studying to be a doctor, you're going to the studio. Did you have a studio? Were you going to like a commercial studio? Like what sort of like practical space were you using? There was a couple of like guys we knew that had like a little ADAT in their house, in their basement. You know, it wasn't like, there weren't proper studios then really. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'd been in studios, you know, so I, uh, at Berkeley and stuff, you know, so I knew my way sure. around it, but yeah, they were not like proper studios, but that's what, so being in Nashville, when I just visited there, it was like kind of reawakened that like studio thing, like the real studio. It's like, and like, it just kind of reminded me like, yeah, what I've been doing is cool, but it's not, I can't really judge do I want to do music or not based on that because this is really the thing, you know, like the professional, the pro level. But what did Michael uh, Sweet hear? That like in that recording that he was like, I'm going to go find this fucking kid on the Berkeley campus and stalk you. I think that was that this is after Berkeley. It was a different the college I went to later. But he um, I just think what he heard was probably like some at the time would sound like kind of modern programming. Like, you know, it was stuff that, you know, guys like him coming from Nick Striper and stuff. They're older bands. You know, they're, they're looking for like what they feel like is a modern sound. And sometimes if they just hear anything that sounds like what's on the radio currently at that time which you know would have been like Atlantis or something so there's like drum loops and some basic program and nothing like incredible i don't i don't think i don't know but it was i think it just sounded kind of modern and he was like wow there's somebody around here that can kind of do this stuff so it was probably that i don't know but he but, discovered you i mean and look and was he wrong i mean he's not wrong because oh. look, you've done so many records michael i mean and by the way he's a great singer and a great guitarist so i have total respect for that guy but i think that's pretty awesome that he heard something in you and he clearly was right it's like my jewish mother she's so proud now <laughs> well yeah i mean he that, that record wasn't like it put me on the map or anything it was just was i i was still in college i just did it and then it was like done and it was i was still thinking i was going to go on it didn't, that he record was the didn't. first that sought you out, though. That's a thing. That's important is the fact that he sought you out. Yeah, that that wasn't like the thread that really led to anything. But it was a cool, you know, thing thinking back that he I guess he heard something that he liked. But a lot of people that they heard something like that, I guess, and whatever I was doing, because they all started telling me, like, you need to go at least try this and do it. And just being in Nashville sort of made me think, oh, there's some more options open. And then Fred, my buddy, was like, you need to come here. He's like, I tell everybody, cause a lot of, a lot of friends he had old musicians were saying, I want to, I want to go to Nashville. Can you help me? And he would tell them all like, no, cause he just didn't want that responsibility of like, you're going to come, you're going to move here. And then you're going to like, I'm responsible for your career or something. But he said, he's like, 
I tell everybody that, but I'm telling you, come here now. Like you'll do really good here. And he wasn't wrong. It was really weird. Like I, I moved there. It was like, I moved there on Monday and was like working on Wednesday for Sony. Like it really oh was gosh. pretty fast. Like within the same week I moved there, I did get hired to do um, like some remixes for like a Sony artist or something. And the junior A and R guy on that project was the guy who ended up signing red to Sony. So it was kind of like, and I'm glad it digs. I, I don't know if, how long if I would have like really stuck it out. And I don't, I'm not sure I was going to be like, I'm going to like wait tables until I make it. Like it, it was just sort of, it, it kind of just things worked out. Like it had a lot of help from, you know, Fred kind of introducing me around, but it just seemed like, I don't know, like I was able to, I didn't know what I was doing, which is weird. I, I just sort of figured it out on the fly, but it was, I guess just being around it, you don't, because you don't have this, you know, if you're not a professional, you don't really know what's happening in the studios. But then once you see it, I think either you get scared, intimidated by it, or you see it and go, oh, I can do this, I think. Mm. And then I guess the latter was what kind of latched on to me. And I figured, okay, I think I can. So I had a little plan then. I thought, well, I'm going to write songs, be a programmer, produce, do arranging, whatever I can do. And then do, and I, still played a lot of guitar back then so i could do session guitar work and i ended up doing all those things and then they all led to like other things they, they led to each other again so like if i got hired as a session guitar player it ended you know didn't take too long before i was writing a song with the artist maybe and you know something stuff like that so or if i wrote songs for an artist then they would hire me to like program on the record or or like do guitar work or something like that. So then pretty soon I was just working for producers. And then uh, I ended up doing just a lot of, you know, pop stuff at first. And I, I really wanted to do rock because I kind of knew that I was like a rock guy and I came from that world. Randy Noth Rose. Yeah. Nothing I was doing was like that at all. So um, I, I figured I just need to make my own thing because no one was going to hire me for a rock record based on, you know, the stuff I was producing, it was like chick pop, you know, in Nashville. So, um, I, it just, again, just worked out. Uh, I was, uh, by this time, Fred had a, a studio he'd built a pretty nice big studio. It was called, it was called Paragon studios at the time. It's still there, but he's, he's sold it since, but it's a big, nice studio. I was working, I had at least renting a room from him in there. And then he hired Jason Rao as an intern and you know, Jason was founding member of Red, and Jason and I were pretty similar guys. We became pretty close friends pretty quick. And one day he just was like, "Hey, you, you want to hear my band?" You know, I've, I'm like, "Sure." And it was Red. So uh, that was like at the same exact time I was thinking like, "Hey, I want to do some rock stuff," and that just like fell in my lap. You know, and it was. I could tell the guy was a great singer and the riffs were pretty cool and it, it needed a lot of work. It was just starting, but, uh, that was it. Like I spent two years or so working on their demo and put like a ton of money into it myself. And just like, I wanted to make it sound like the record. So like when the labels heard it, they just knew what they were getting mm. and then it, they got signed. And by that time I was, you know, I had gotten up to the level of, I'd been producing a couple records, like, some like curb would give me a record to produce and sony had given me like one or two things but the red record was like the thing where it was like no looking back i was still doing you know sessions and programming for other people and arrangements up until that point but then after the red thing it was sort of like i just like wrote and produced pretty much from that point on well you know what yeah. i've learned about this i i call this passive aggressive manifestation <laughs> that you're just like no nah, i'm not gonna be a doctor you're like no please don't you're so good at this <laughs> All right, come to Nashville. I want to make Randy Rhodes records. You're gonna do the Dixie Chicks. Fuck this shit. <laughs> Become friends with a dude. You're like, you like metal, t dude. I'm starting this band. You you are? Yeah, yeah we're doing the studio. Well, I th I'm thinking about going to being a surgeon. Listen, just just try try making this sound how you think it should sound. Really? Like, dude, I I love. You're just coasting, but you're like still so high level. You're like, I I want to. You're my spirit animal, man. I love well, this shit. Go on. <laughs> well, that's, I would say that that is a pretty accurate uh, retelling of the whole, of the whole thing. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm like a, 
I definitely like it's not that it's not so much passive. I guess it's just that I. I don't, I don't try to, I don't try to force things that much. You're aloof. You know, I, I, you're like, you're like the girl that's like, well, I mean, if, if like, are you around Friday night? I mean, maybe I guess I have to look at my, <laughs> I'll see. It's like Mariah Carey yeah. calls you. Hey man, I know you do metal Rob, but like, would you, would you do my stuff? I got my wife, uh, my, my girl's calling right now. Can I call you back in 20? Like that's you. I love that about you. Well, you know, the things that you, uh, that's how the things come to you though. If you, if you don't, kind of need it and if you're not like clinging to it it then it doesn't run from you and that's it's still true now you know in, in production and even when you're creating something you know if you're trying to force it too much it's when you get all like clamped up and it doesn't happen so i think i've always had a pretty easy like let's just see what happens kind of thing and but ready for it when it comes that's a big part of it like you have to be able to to go after it when it does present itself but yeah. yeah. No, that's a really poignant way of putting it. And yeah, I mean, when I first got introduced to you and just introduced to Starset and joining the band and hearing about Red, I mean, you really, there is, you have a very distinctive sound in your productions. And like, I hear that in Red and in Starset and, you know, everything that you do. And um, I guess, you know, I'd be curious to hear, I mean, you, you mentioned starting with Red and putting a lot of investment into that. Mm-hmm. Like what, what was that experience like working with them? And did you kind of grow into your sound over the course of that? Or were you already kind of doing what that turned into and you kind of brought them along into that, that part of you? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I, I, that, I know what you, I guess what you're talking about with that sound that definitely developed over probably starting really like around that time with red. Like I, I guess I'd always had things that I liked and had done, but it, and I guess I, I got hired a lot even before Red, you know, when I was doing sessions and all that kind of stuff, because people said I had a sound for whatever it was. Like there was a certain way I played guitar, a certain way that I did whatever. But like f- for me, I guess I, I was, I've always been pretty focused on like what I like. And then if I like it, I assume that there have to be other people who probably are going to like it. And I really tried to not shape it for like what I think someone else might like. I just really tried to make myself like it as much as I could. And that was what, I guess that's what the sound became. It's just like, I'm looking for whatever. So it didn't matter if I was doing like acoustic guitar work or stuff that you wouldn't really associate probably with whatever you would call my sound now. It, I st- it still had a sound because I was, it was within this like world of what I l- wanted to hear. So it was pretty consistent, like across whatever I was doing. It, it just had this thing where you'd hear it and go, that's probably Rob doing it. And maybe I was just repeating myself. Maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't so uh, <laughs> grand. But I, with Red, that the real, like the current sound that I really fell into with my production, I don't know what it was. There was Their music was, I guess it, it just, it sort of happened over all that, that time. I was doing a lot of string arranging and working with string arrangers on other things. And I always liked that sound and it, their music, I don't know, just the darkness of it. And it, it felt, I, I like dynamics a lot and all, all these random things I'm saying, it just sort of all kind of coalesced into this, like strings and piano, that kind of stuff. It felt very natural to me to add it to red other bands that were doing rock and maybe there weren't a lot of them putting strings on stuff. And if they did, it was like almost a gimmick or something. The music wasn't really written for it. And I don't know. It just made sense to me, like strings with that stuff and the dynamics of it. it just, I liked it. And I know that like, it's probably a lot of people were telling me like, this wasn't going to work, you know? And it, huh. I, I heard that a lot. Like it was like, you know, people don't want like this metal with strings and shit. Like they just want to like rock out. And I don't know. It was like that thing. Like maybe it won't have the broadest audience in the world, but I, it just didn't matter to me because I felt like the people who would like it would really, really, really like it. And, you know, maybe it wasn't going to be that broad. And I, <coughs> I think that's true of, of all the stuff. I think it's true of star set. You know, it, I mean, that stuff's pretty broad. A lot of people like it a lot, but I think the people who get it and like it, all the cross genre stuff that we're doing, like they love it. Like it's something, it just, when you're, when you're honest with it, when you're like, I'm doing this because it, like, I like it a lot and I'm trying to make it as, as good as I can make it for me. Like, I just want to listen to it when you're kind of putting that sort of honesty into it. I think that people connect with that. Like it's a very intangible thing, but it, it might not make the music as broad as it could be, which, you know, it's a business and this is, that's what the labels, they want it to be maybe a bit more broad, but 
those that do connect with it tend, I think, to like it like way more, like they because they really feel it. And uh, so, yeah, that's it's a pretty simple thing, I guess. It's just like I like to do what I like, and mm. I like all those things, I like strings, and but I like it heavy too at times. And I like it dynamic, and you know, if, I just kind of knew if you want to make something huge, you have to. Um, make it quiet before and that makes the big sections bigger and all that kind of stuff. So I just tried to, the red stuff from a very early place felt, I wasn't really trying to put all that stuff into it. It just naturally felt like the thing to do. Like this is what I would do without even trying. I would, I would put strings here. This, this chorus feels like it wants strings. Let's do it. And uh, that just became sort of the thing that kind of, I guess I'm associated with and, Dustin, you know, he liked Red a lot. I think he really liked the Innocence and Instinct album. And that's kind of, you know, when he wanted me to start working on transmissions, that's just what he wanted. He was like, just do the thing that you do to this and like make it that thing. And, you know, of course he has a ton of influence himself. You know, he brings a lot of that. So it's a great mix of, of all of that. So and we can talk more about Starset. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, maybe we get into that in the second episode. I don't know what we're like on time. We got a little bit of time left in this episode here. Uh, how long was the time between Red and Star Set, or the first Red, you know, demos? Uh, well, yeah, well, the first Red demos were like early. They got their first record came out in two thousand six. So, and then you know we did three, like three or four records together before I worked with Dustin. That was like. When was that like 2015 maybe for transmissions yeah so there was a period of time there so once yeah. you know that's that took off and you and you did kind of find your you know genre and your sound and everything mm -hmm. what did that look like you know in turn you said you kind of focused you went more just to the producing and writing but uh, you know from like a for a lifestyle yeah. change was that like was that like that click they're like all right this is what i'm doing now well yeah it was a bit hectic again i was young ish and uh yeah, you know, when you have, okay, so when you, we can talk more about creativity and stuff in the, maybe the next episode, but when you're, I didn't have a good handle on that, you know, the, the constant like ideas I was getting and like as, it just, it was hard to manage, you know, like the, uh, and then you, all of a sudden you're, you know, manage pretty, your genius just coming from a fucking place. So you're just awesome so all the time, <laughs> just being like, here's, here's hit after hit after well, fucking hit. It's just coming. I can't stop it. It's just so fast. Uh, Dustin, write it down. <laughs> <laughs> no it's more like managing your life than uh of just uh yeah it wasn't quite that it was it was just trying to like stay sane like it, not just mm -hmm. from it, it's like you're, you're getting all these opportunities to do stuff and you don't know what to do with it. it it's not just the ideas and music and stuff you're doing it's just like everything about it all of a sudden you're kind of go from just like low key to like boom you're now you're producing like these big records and doing all this stuff so it was i was I don't know. It was, it got a little just kind of crazy and I, I didn't know like what I was doing. It was hard to like organize things and to like get stuff done. Things took like way longer to finish than they should have. Um, you know, cause I probably went through this phase of being like a super perfectionist with everything and all that. And I was doing mostly red albums because like the first record did really well. And then the, we kind of they wanted to go right into the second record and that Can you define really well, like what's really well. Cause I feel like depending on the year, Really well could be like, if you don't make a million, you suck. And maybe now yeah. it's 25,000. So where are we at with really well? Um, well, so this is right on the cusp of, I mean, it's a platinum record, but this was right on the cusp of uh, when they, it's kind of like iTunes and Napster and all that bullshit was just starting. So like the sales. So aggregated were, sales. Yeah. Aggregated I mean, I think, amongst I, all, it all now. At the time back then, it was like it went gold back then. And that was like that pretty good for that. Like that was a pretty big record. They had a top 10 active rock hit at the time. And now it's like, I don't know what is. I'm pretty sure that record is platinum. Uh, they, they've I sold a lot I hope one day to forget my platinum records. They, <laughs> <laughs> they've, sold a, they've sold a lot of records over the time. They've done pretty well. So uh, yeah, that was a whirlwind, like the whole mid early 2000s and then it i ended up signing like a, a deal with emi just to do just as a songwriter to do and i, I kind of started doing the thing where i was traveling around to you know nashville new york la just writing and writing and writing and i really hated that that was like and it was funny because early on when i first 
you know, realize, okay, I am doing music as a career. I probably would have saw like that as my end goal. I just wanted to be like a more of a songwriter and just sort of write on people's records and produce once in a while. And like, that was, it's like the classic case if you get a, the exact thing that you thought you wanted, but then you hate it. That's not at all what you wanted. So you, you really wanted something else and you mistook it for that. Uh, so I, I mean, I did, that was a, good time and why you know i wrote some songs with some great bands and we had you know did some cool stuff but it was not like i'm not like the show up at two and write a song guy like that's just not my thing and some guys are like that and they're great at it um i wish i were more like that but so hold on can i can i i'm i'm not as smart as you so let me see if i can just <laughs> soak it in for a second you might be you might be smarter hold on so like, Don't there's feed into his ego. There's a, there's a Bukowski saying that is, find what you love and let it kill you. Is this mm. what you're explaining? Is this what you're exemplifying? That's a, maybe a slightly different example of chasing this idea of something that you think you're going to like, which is, well, for me, it was just, I'm going to write songs, show up and write songs for people. and but, but like, without, I didn't pay enough attention to probably what Bukowski was talking about, which was the thing I really loved, which was really deeply connecting with the music and the artist and <clears throat> bringing something out which usually takes a lot of time to just for me at least in the, the process that i i liked i needed to actually get back to that and sort of get out of this like nine to five songwriter like it's a job thing because to me i was like if i'm just gonna do a job and show up and like yeah i can write a melody great so but so what i mean that's not that interesting to me like i need more than just like i wrote a song and i go home like i it has to be like a deeper connection. I would rather do a different job than, you know, I'm like, I'll go back to school and, and do the doctor thing again. If I'm just going to like write <laughs> these songs, you know, it's, I needed to like have some deeper connection. I realized it's like, I like working with like a, an artist where we're going to like create some pretty big, epic, cool thing over like a year. Cool. And then we're going to make a whole new thing. And, and that was the example maybe of that quote of like letting yeah. that kill you because that does kill you. You 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 have to go so fucking deep into that process over like a year where you're just like you the thing turns you inside out. And I that's what I was missing from this nine to five songwriter thing. It was like I it wasn't doing that for me. Like I was it was just mad. I was like, okay, there's a there's a melody. Is that good? Cool. You weren't and willing then, to uh, die on yeah. the hill, but with being an everyday songwriter. You're not going to die on that hill staring at that melody every day from nine to five. It wasn't that interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great way of putting it. And the fact that you, you know, searching for that deeper kind of connection to music and taking something and making it huge, which is a great uh, segue into what we're going to talk about in our second episode, which is working with the, the one and only star set. So all the Starset fans that that put up with this episode waiting for this moment, I got great news. <laughs> Next week, we're going to talk a lot about Starset. <laughs> but Rob, thank you for taking the time to hang with us right now. Um, is there anything you want to like let people know about? I know your um, you know your social media looks like it's at Rob Graves with a three for the yeah e. the e is a three yep <laughs> uh, and robgraves.com. yep yeah I'm. Um, People feel free to check that out. I mean, I, I've, they probably, uh, the fans of this probably know that I released some so, uh, solo stuff, just like piano. I'm not really here to promote anything, so. No, uh, but we'll talk but, about it. We'll get into it in the yeah, next we'll, episode. We'll I think it. we want to hear a lot about it for sure. But where, yeah. wherever they can find it, go to your website, your socials and follow you. And I think you can find yeah. all of that there, right? Yeah, just the socials are the best place to find me. Or Spotify. Cool. That's that's the most passive aggressive, aggressive marketing I've ever heard. Yeah, <laughs> I, I you should probably hear about my solo. It's it's piano. Like you said, I'm like piano. And I love. I think piano is the greatest instrument in the world, and if you can play it well, like you could sing to my heart. So like immediately, was, but you're like we don't, but we don't, but we don't care. I don't care. Whatever. I'm not promoting it. I that was like Maynard. That was Maynard standing still on stage and saying, "Don't look at me." That was the equivalent. That was my. <laughs> Oh my uh, gosh. Well, <laughs> next week. <laughs> so guys, check out 2020-d.com, like and subscribe, and we will see you then. Our evolution as musicians happened behind closed doors, okay? There was no need to post a video and this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. Whereas kids these days, that's what you do. So what happens is we're literally witnessing the growth. So like a lot of like the younger guitarists, like in you know, like Polyphia and Chan and things like that, I think are obviously evidently massively influential, 
but even more so, I'm really interested to see what happens when they're, music, when they're making music in their 40s. I want to see what they do. I want to see how they wind up evolving because, you know, my generation, our generation, evolved quite differently. So when I, when I came out of the gate, you know, with my first couple records, it was kind of like I was already seasoned because I put in all my time, but, you know, like this, you know, yeah. by myself. Mm, sure. And you can cultivate what your sound is by yourself and not feel the pressure to do X, Y, and Z because it's trendy.